All right, how's everybody doing? Hotel. Hey, this is Michael M. Hotel, founder of the African History Network, host of the African History Network show. I'm a talk show host, researcher, lecturer, and writer. And it is Saturday, January 26, 2019. And uh, we are live. Hope everybody's doing well. The government shutdown is over. I knew it was coming to an end soon. Some of you all saw the broadcast I did uh, uh, Friday, January 25th, as the announcement was being made that a tentative deal was reached, right? So check that out. Uh, at our Facebook fan page, The African History Network, The African History Network, and our YouTube channel, Michael M. Hotel. All right, so I wanted to do a follow-up story here. You know, back um, January 3rd, I think it was, we talked about how um, actor Boris Kojo and a lot of African-American celebrities went to Ghana as part of the uh, Full Circle Festival, the Full Circle Festival in Ghana. And uh, they went there. This was dealing with the commemoration, the 400-year commemoration of um, Jamestown, Virginia, August 20th, 1619, when that uh, ship of 20-some-odd uh, Africans went into Jamestown, Virginia, and they were as indentured servants. Uh, a lot of people call them slaves, but they were as indentured servants. So we know August 20th, 1619 is the 400th year anniversary of that. Now, there were African people here in this land we call the United States of America going back tens of thousands of years. But the Full Circle Festival uh, was held in Ghana during uh, Christmas and New Year's, uh, New Year's Day. Uh, Christmas 2018, New Year's Day, January 1st, 2019. And you had a lot of African-American celebrities there. Um, and during the period of time that this took place, actor, action, uh, action star, martial arts expert, uh, Michael Jai White was installed as a uh, chief in Ghana, okay? So, uh, you know, I showed you some pictures, and we'll show you some pictures here. We'll show you some pictures of uh, the uh, African-American celebrities in Ghana. And uh, Michael Jai White talked about how uh, important this was to him and to reconnect to African history and culture. FaceToFaceAfrica.com has articles about this, uh, one from January 20th, 2019. Uh, to be made chief in Ghana is more relevant than to be knighted by the queen. This is what Michael Jai White said, to be, made chief, to be made a chief in Ghana is more relevant than to be knighted by the queen, the queen of England, okay? Because a lot of times people talk about their titles of sir and duke and things like this, right? Which comes from England. But he's saying, no, it's more important to be installed as a, as a chief in Ghana, okay? And then there were, um, he talked about how there were some negative responses that he received from African Americans who um, really suffer from self hatred, okay, and has some negative things to say about him being installed as a uh, chief in Ghana. All right, so everybody share this broadcast on your Facebook page. Invite your friends to tune in also. Uh, this is the African History Network. Follow us on our Facebook fan page, the African History Network, uh, and on our YouTube channel, Michael M. Hotep, I M H O T E P. I'm the founder of the African History Network. African American business owners, post the name of your business here on the thread of the broadcast. We'll let you know how you can uh, advertise with us and reach thousands of potential customers across the country. All right, so uh, let me show you some of these pictures here. Um, the first, we'll look at um, the, the uh, African American actors. Uh, you know, you have Michael Jai White, you have Boris Kojo, you had uh, also. Uh, Anthony Anderson. Let me turn on the share feature here. Okay, because we're using Zoom. You had uh, Jaman Hansu and also Jendaya as well. All right. So this is an article. Um, this is one of the early ones from FaceToFaceAfrica.com, which is a really good source of uh, African continental uh, news, news on the continent of Africa, but they cover like African American news as well. So you see the articles that we share uh, pretty much on a daily basis from face to face Africa.com. So it's one of the um, African news sources that I monitor on a daily basis. Okay, and then here we have uh, uh, Boris Kojo as well. So Boris Kojo, his father is Ghanaian and his mother is from, is from Germany. Okay, so he's mixed. 
And uh, here's another picture of them um, here as well. Okay, this is just one. This is just one of the pictures. Um, here's a picture of them uh, also in Ghana near um, one of the uh, oceans uh, as well, and they're having some type of ceremony. And they talked about how this was very spiritual, very emotional, very touching to reconnect to uh, African uh, history and culture. Here's, a, here's a, a really good picture of some of the celebrities there. We see, see Nicole Ari Parker, who is the wife of Boris Kojo. We first saw them uh, together on the TV show Soul Food, okay, which was on Showtime. And I remember when Soul Food ended, I canceled my subscription to Showtime because I didn't need it. Here's another picture of them uh, as well, okay? All right, so if we look at... Um, uh, just very quickly, here get some background information. Some of you all saw the broadcast I did back on January 3rd dealing with uh, the first story of them going to Ghana, okay, and the impact that it had on them. But uh, the decision to bring the dozens of celebrities to Ghana follows a request from the government of Ghana in line with its Year of Return 2019 program, Year of Return 2019 program, welcoming African Americans and the uh, Black diaspora to return to the country where their ancestors were kidnapped and enslaved in America some 400 years ago. Okay, um, and you should um, you may want to register for the online course that I teach. Also, Ancient Kemet, the Moors, and the Maafa understanding the transatlantic slave trade, what they didn't teach you in school. Because I go deep into this history. We go back thousands of years in history. And um, <clears throat> you're dealing with um, going back to at least going back to 1441 when the Portuguese get involved in the transatlantic slave trade. The Portuguese were the first ones involved. The Spanish are right behind them. England comes later. But the Portuguese dominate the transatlantic slave trade for the first 200 years. And then England is going to England is going to take it over and dominate. And we know that cotton be, cotton was king, right? But before cotton was king, uh, sugar was king. Okay. And when you look at you know, so right now you have a lot. You have some people uh, who are saying, oh well, Senator Kamala Harris, you know, she's Jamaican. She's not of uh, African slave descent or descendant of slaves. Things like this. Um, you ever studied the history of Jamaica? Slavery was in Jamaica before it was here because Jamaica was conquered by Christopher Columbus and his henchmen about 1494. Jamaica was under control of the Spanish before it became under control of the British. So you study the sugarcane plantations. The sugarcane plantations were very, very brutal plantations. Life expectancy on them was something like maybe five to seven years. And when you study slavery in the Caribbean, slavery in the Caribbean in general was harsher than slavery in the 13 colonies and in the United States in general. So when I hear people, you know, talk about Jamaicans, right? You have, a, you have, have you studied the history of them? Have you studied the history of Jamaica? They, they are of descendants of, uh, of slave ancestry as well. Okay, so we really have to we really have to stop playing these games. And when you study where Africans were taken from, a lot of them coming from West Africa, a lot of them coming from Ghana, brought here. Well, they were taken from Ghana and taken into Jamaica also. And if you actually study the history of slavery in the Caribbean, you know that they were going to the Caribbean in general, usually first before they were coming here because they had they had the the breaking grounds they had the plantations where the where the slaves were seasoned and prepared to come here some are going to stay there but some are going to come here and this is where they were broken this is when they were trained to be slaves so i hear a lot of people talking about dos descendants of slaves being a descendant of a slave does not mean you should have a slave mentality if you want to claim being a descendant of a slave, you should study the history of slavery and study the 800 year occupation of Europe by the Africans known as the Moors going back to 711 AD and study where the Moors come from and study the teachings that the Moors take into Europe coming from ancient Kemet, ancient Egypt. If you want to claim DOS, okay, you need to, you, you should really understand what you're talking about. All right, so let's continue here. <clears throat> Jamaica play a major role. Yeah, Jamaica was crucial. And Jamaica, this is where you have Queen Nanny and the Jamaican Maroons 
who fight against the British and beat the British so badly, they forced the British into a peace treaty about 1739, okay? Because the British gained control of Jamaica from the Spanish. And Queen Anne and Jamaica Maroons, they were, uh, it's believed they were Ashanti from Ghana. So we have to, we have to understand that the, the same places where Africans were taken from that came here, they were taken into the Caribbean. And then about 20% of African Americans have ancestry that go back to Angola and the Congo. So when we look at Angola prison in Louisiana, right, why is it called Angola prison? One, Angola prison is on the remains of, a, is on the land that used to be a former slave plantation. Two, most of the slaves on that slave plantation came from Angola. That's why it's called Angola prison. So we have to stop playing these divisive games, okay? If all Europeans disappear tomorrow, Negro, Negroes will still be Negroes. All right, so let's continue here. How's everybody doing? Share this broadcast on your Facebook page. Invite your friends to tune in. African-American business owners, post the name of your business here on the thread of the broadcast also. Okay, so um, the first article I saw dealing with this trip was from Blavity.com, Blavity.com, which is a African-American digital news source, and it's uh, owned and ran by African-American millennials, and they target African-American millennials as well. Boris Kojo hosted a trip back to Ghana and brought Black Hollywood with them. Boris Kojo hosted a trip back to Ghana and brought Black Hollywood uh, with them. And, and, you know, I posted this article here uh, on our fan page, the African History Network, and people went crazy uh, uh, over the pictures. And you know, some of the women went crazy also. OK, that's that's understandable. Right. Uh, and then let me show you this. Uh, let me load this up here. We'll show you this. OK, so this is a really good picture of uh, some of the celebrities also. And he talked about the life-changing impact this trip had on him as well, okay? So we see Anthony Anderson. Uh, we see, uh, you know, some other celebrities here. We see Boris Kojo over to the right, all right? So this was in Ghana as well. Okay, so then uh, you had uh, an article from uh, face2faceafrica.com uh, another one from face2faceafrica.com from January 12, 2019. And we posted these articles here on our Facebook fan page, the African History Network. Uh, watch the moment African-American actor Michael Jai White was installed as chief in Ghana. Watch the moment African-American actor Michael Jai White was installed as chief in Ghana, okay? And um, let, me show you this, let me show you some of these pictures here also. So this is uh, this is really good. This is something really big, and it shows African American actors and actresses reconnecting to the motherland. Okay, so here Michael Jai White is uh, sitting down with him. He's there with his wife, and um, they have the installment ceremony where he's made a Ghanaian chief. Okay, um, here's another picture as well. There's a little video here also. Uh, now, Michael Jai White on, um, what is this, Twitter, Instagram, I guess. He said, um, let's see. He said, okay, so we take buses and boats to see the king of Okwamu who appoints me. Um, so he, so he, was, he was named King Nana Okoto III Odopin. O-D-O-P-O-N, not exactly sure how to pronounce that last name. But um, that, and, and uh, let's see, he said, I've got life of Brian flashing through my head, but quickly realize the significance and accept the position wholeheartedly. Um, I've got some work to do for the, for the place of my origin, okay? And let's see here. His, I'll tell you what his name means in just a minute. I'm looking forward here. Okay. Because it means something like the, uh, hold on, the uh, tree whose roots do not bend to the storm. Something like that. Okay, I'll give you the exact meaning of his name. Uh, yeah, the tree with strong roots that does not fear the storm. Okay. Uh, he was bestowed the name uh, Nana Okoto III. Uh, Odopon, Odopon, which means the tree with strong roots that does not fear the storm, 
okay? And uh, he, he could not help but share his excitement after he was installed as chief uh, by um, uh, Kwafo, by Kwafo Okoto III, okay? All right, now, some familiar faces at the ceremony included Boris Kojo and Bozoma, Bozoma uh, St. John, um, who, who used to be an executive with Uber, okay? Uh, so they have uh, some videos in here as well and some pictures. Let me show you some more of these pictures here also. Just a second, okay. So here's another picture of him sitting down. His wife is next to him. Uh, we got some more pictures here as well. All right. So these are all part of the uh, installment ceremony, okay, while they're there in, in Ghana. Now, this is uh, Bozoma uh, St. John next to him. This looks like a scene from Coming to America Part Two, right? The next generation, right? <laughs> Coming to America, the next generation. Welcome to Zamunda. All right. Uh, so here's some more pictures here. And then let me see here. I think we can, uh, I think I have the speakers working. You can play this video. Let me plug up the, uh, plug up the speaker and we'll play this video so you can hear it. Okay, this is the new laptop and the headphone jack is on the other side. I'm still trying to get used to this because my, my other laptop was dying on me, and I was forced to break down and buy a new laptop. I really didn't want to do it, but to be able to keep putting the information out, I had to do it. Okay, so let's uh, try to turn up the sound here. Let's try to play this. <laughs> So check this out. This is like really, really uh, interesting, right? And it helps reconnect us to African history, African culture, okay? All right, so now, uh, as would be expected, right? He got some negative backlash for this. And he wrote a letter, Michael Jai White wrote a letter talking about this as well, the negative, negative backlash that he got as well, all right? And um, let's see this here. Uh, let me flip over to this other article. So this, once again, name of this article, Watch the Moment African-American Actor Michael Jai White Was Installed as a Chief in Ghana. This is from FaceToFaceAfrica.com. And Face to Face Africa, I mean, they really have some really, really good articles. Uh, AtlantaBlackStar.com has good articles dealing with our history. Um, HowAfrica.com is another news source uh, I read daily. They have some really good articles. You see some of the articles we post here from HowAfrica.com as well, okay? All right, so, so then there was another article from um, um, FaceToFaceAfrica.com, and it's entitled, To Be Made Chief in Ghana is More Relevant Than to Be Knighted by the Queen. This is what Michael Jai White said to be made chief in Ghana is more relevant than to be knighted by the queen. Now, this article is from January 20th, 2019, okay? So we're going to go to this here in just a minute. Everybody, hey, share this broadcast on your Facebook page. Invite your friends to tune in also. If you like this type of information, you can support the African History Network. We definitely need your support. Um, you can donate to the African History Network, paypal.me. 
paypal.me forward slash the AHN show, paypal.me forward slash the AHN show. If you have a PayPal account, if you don't, go to our website, africanhistorynetwork.com, africanhistorynetwork.com, click on the yellow donate button, and uh, you can use your debit card, credit card, uh, and the donations help us to keep doing the research, stay on the air, keep broadcasting our Sunday night show, the African History Network show uh, that we do on 19 a.m. WFDF here in Detroit. And uh, African American business owners, email us at customer service at AfricanHistoryNetwork.com. Customer service at AfricanHistoryNetwork.com will let you know how you can advertise with the African History Network on the audio podcast of our Sunday night show and the podcast we do throughout the week. We're on seven different podcast platforms, and uh, we take your 30-second and 60-second commercial and put it into the audio podcast of our shows. Uh, email us customer service at africanhistorynetwork.com, okay? And we have a, a, a special promotion. First month is 50% off. Okay, so if we look at this article here from this other one from facetofaceafrica.com from January 20th, to be made chief in Ghana is more relevant than to be knighted by the queen, okay? And uh, they talk about Michael Jai White being installed uh, at the um, uh, Full Circle Festival in Ghana that took place in December 2018 during the holiday, Christmas, and, and uh, New Year's Eve, okay? And uh, the article says, in his return to the United States, the, mar the martial arts expert has been sharing his experience and how uh, the moments he spent in Ghana have changed his perception about the continent. We know Ros Ros uh, Rosario Dawson was there as well. Gabri Sidibe, who's on Empire, who we first saw in Precious, she was there also, okay? Now, while, while uh, Michael Jai White's visit to Ghana and in Stuhlman have, however, received some backlash from his fans in the Black American community, the actor has since written about the negative reactions, uh, saying that it is ideal it, it is ideal to be made a chief in Akwamu, okay, in Ghana, where he traces his roots, than to be made a knight by the Queen of England. Okay, he said, "quote For me to be installed by uh, by the King Kwafo Okoto the Third of Akwamu." there in Ghana is far more relevant than if I were knighted by Queen Elizabeth, whose royal bloodline doesn't go back as far, okay? Queen Elizabeth, whose royal bloodline does not go back as far. Ghana has been the eighth country uh, I visited. They've all been astoundingly beautiful with classy and very educated people who speak more languages than we do. And we know that when we look at immigrants in this country, right? Because Donald Trump loves to talk about immigrants. Okay, you see that you see the story about the uh, while he was um, uh, trying to fight for this fake ass wall. Okay, he had undocumented immigrants working at his uh, golf course in New Jersey. Okay, the 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 uh, uh, Washington Post uh, just had this had the story today about that. All right. We'll try to pull it up for you as well. Okay, so, but when we look at immigrants in this country, African immigrants are the most educated immigrants in this country, especially uh, Nigerians, okay? So Trump had negative things to say about African immigrants. He said they were coming from S-hole countries, but he didn't say that these are the most educated people in the country. If we look at this article, uh, just from the day, Washington Post, January 26, 2019, Trump's golf course employed undocumented workers and then, and then fired them amid showdown over border wall. This is, this is Trump who shut down the government, partial shutdown of the government, 800,000 employees did not get a paycheck for two pay periods, and this is to build a fake wall at the Mexican border, he said, to stop crime and, and drugs and undocumented immigrants coming through. But more drugs and more terrorists and undocumented immigrants come through the Canadian border. But those are mainly white undocumented immigrants, so he's not calling for a border wall there. They had spent years on the staff of Donald Trump's golf club winning Employee of the Month awards and receiving glowing letters of recommendation. 
Some were trusted enough to hold the keys to Eric Trump's weekend home. They were experienced enough to know that when Donald Trump ordered chicken wings, they were to serve him two orders on one plate. But on January 18th, about a dozen employees at Trump National Golf Club in Westchester, New York, Westchester County, New York, were summoned one by one to talk with the human resources executive from Trump headquarters. During the meetings, they were fired because they are undocumented immigrants, according to interviews with the workers and their attorney. The fired workers are from Latin America. The sudden firings, which were previously unreported, follow last year's revelations of undocumented labor at a Trump club in New Jersey, where employees were subsequently dismissed. The firings show Donald Trump's this Donald Trump's business was relying on undocumented workers, even as the even as Donald Trump demanded a border wall to keep out undocumented immigrants. The whole thing is a fraud. Donald Trump is like the biggest con man I've ever seen. And in business school, we study fraud. We study cons. Trump's demand for border wall funding led to the government shutdown that ended Friday after nearly 35 days. So he wants to demonize and criminalize undocumented immigrants. He has them working at his, at his properties. Imagine that. Check out this article here. This story just broke. Now, there have been two previous, at least two previous articles from the Washington Post. This one just broke today, okay? David David A. Farenthold, who's been writing, who's been doing a lot of really good research dealing with Donald Trump and Trump's finances, and Joshua Partlow have the byline on this. They, they're, they're the writers of this article, okay? Uh, and this deals with his, uh, this, this, this particular article deals with Trump's National Golf Club in New York. There was a previous article dealing with undocumented immigrants working at his golf course in New Jersey. Okay, so check this out, Washington Post. All right, let's continue here. Okay, so Michael Jai White said to, uh, he said to be uh, installed uh, by, the, by the king, uh, Kwafo Okoto III of, of Kwamu, is far more relevant than if I were knighted by Queen Elizabeth, whose royal bloodline doesn't go back as far. Ghana has been the eighth African country I visited. They've all been astoundingly uh, beautiful with classy and very educated people who speak more languages than we do. Quote, those of us that felt some kind of way, maybe you can begin to direct that anger uh, toward those orchestrators that made you hate who you are, those those who would find comfort in you hating your own people and those who would find it threatening for you to unite with your people in solidarity. Okay, he, uh, Michael Jai White said in the, in the statement. So he's talking about those who gave him negative backlash for going and those who, who, who've been taught to hate who they are and love who they can't be, okay? So Michael Jai White did not end his piece without educating his cynics on the rich culture and history of the continent of Africa. Now, in his full statement in the article from facetofaceafrica.com, they have his full statement here, okay? Now, let's take a listen here to what Malcolm X said, asking the question of who are you and who taught you to hate yourself, okay? And uh, let me turn up the volume here. I hope you can, uh, you should be able to hear this just a second. Who are you? You don't know. Don't tell me Negro. That's nothing. What were you before the white man named you a Negro? And where were you? And what did you have? What was yours? What language did you speak then? What was your name? It couldn't have been Smith or Jones or Bunch or Powell. That wasn't your name. They don't have those kind of names where you and I came from. No, what was your name? And why don't you now know what your name was then? Where did it go? Where did you lose it? Who took it? And how did he take it? What tongue did you speak? How did the man take your tongue? 
Where is your history? How did the man wipe out your history? How did the man, what did the man do to make you as dumb as you are right now? All right. So there's Malcolm dropping it, right? Who taught you to hate yourself? He said, what was your name? It couldn't have been Smith or Jones or Bunch or Powell. That wasn't your name. They don't have those type of names where you and I came from. He said, what happened to your history? How did the man wipe out your history? What method did he use to make you as dumb as you are right now? Okay? So these, you know, hearing Malcolm ask those questions, that causes you to think, right? So, um, and you know, it's it's that it's that same type of self-hatred that causes many of us to attack African American women who come forward and say they're they are the victims of sexual molestation, the victims of sexual abuse. Okay. And instead of listening to them, we want to attack the victim, which makes it harder and more difficult for African American women who are victims of sexual abuse to come forward. Because of, because of the way oftentimes they are mistreated by their own people. So if we go back and look at uh, Michael Jai White's full statement, he said, teachable moments, teachable moments. With the recent pilgrimage to Ghana, I shared with friends and new, uh, and new title given to me, the king of Akwamu. There have been some interesting negative responses from the black community, though the positives far outweigh the negatives. I, I choose today to focus on those negative ones because I believe there is great power in studying this mindset to provide teachable moments. And we're dealing with a mindset of brainwashed Negroes. We're dealing with a mindset of people who've been taught to hate themselves. Many of them call themselves descendants of slaves, right? What were you before you were a slave? What, what, what were our ancestors before they were slaves, right? So if that's your frame of reference, just right there, that's problematic. Because just in this land, African people have been here in the land we call the United States of America, going back at least 51,700 years. And if you read the first Americans were Africans documented evidence by Dr. David M. Hotep, you would know this. If you listen to any of my 11 interviews with Dr. David M. Hotep, you would know this, okay? We're talking about the Khoisan who have the oldest DNA on the planet and who are the ancestors to the Ainu and the Twa went all around the world and they were here in this land. There were pyramid mounds built up and down the Mississippi River. The early, what are called Indian mound builders, these were, the Khoisan. See, we don't, we don't understand our history. Okay. All right. So he said that uh, though the positives far outweigh the negatives, I choose today to focus on those negative ones because I feel there is great power in studying this mindset to provide teachable moments. We American born blacks were bred to hate our own people and ourselves. Self-deprivation self is buried deep within our subconscious. We found comfort in calling ourselves derogatory names and sabotage our own progress because we've been convinced we are unworthy of the same thing whites or other nations enjoy. So this because we're the only people. And if you if you saw the uh you saw the video I posted today, um, so when I shot the video yesterday and we talked about the government shutdown, right? And we talked about Roger Stone being indicted and the government shutdown is over. I had on a shirt and a tie. Because earlier that morning I was being filmed for a TV show here in Detroit called Detroit Wants to Know. So uh the host is Steve Hood, and we and um he posted uh uh some extra footage that we shot. And we were talking about negative uh, corporate controlled hip hop. And we were talking about Cardi B. And he was asking the question, what should I tell my Sunday school students about Cardi B? Because they look up to her, right? So watch that video. We posted here on our Facebook fan page, the African History Network, okay? And I talked about how, um, the, 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 I talked about how, how, corporate, how corporate controlled hip hop Help to replace the conscious hip hop. 
of the late 80s, early 90s, and how the conscious hip hop was taken over by the corporate conglomerates and it was and, 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 and it was sent in a different direction. And you had the rise of the of the gangster rap. You have the rise of the talking about the talking about uh, the, uh, drugs and criminality and violence and a proliferation of guns, things like this in the in the in the music. Okay, um, but when you look at the corporate control hip hop, we're the only people where our music is allowed to have negative derogatory racial epithets because other people's music don't call them racial slurs and things like this in general. You may hear one or two, or, or may one or two, may, may hear one or two here and there, but it's like, you know, I think it must be, I must be, I think it must be in that contract. They have to use the N word a certain number of times in the, in, 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 in the popular hip hop songs. We're the only people who, who would tolerate something like that. Why? Because what you do for yourself, what you do to yourself, and what you allow other people to do to you and get away with is based upon what you think about yourself. What you think about yourself is based upon what you have been taught about yourself. And what you've been taught about yourself is based upon everything you've read, heard, and seen about yourself. So other people who have their history and culture intact, and it's your history and culture that gives you your VIPs, your values, your interests, and your principles, and this influences your cultural paradigm that you see reality through. This gives you your self-esteem, okay? And this influences uh, uh, the causes you get involved in. This influences your art, your music, your dance. Other people won't tolerate that because they have, they have uh, a higher self-esteem and they have higher racial esteem or group esteem. They think more highly of the, their own people as a group. But if you've been if you've been programmed to call yourself an N word and it's all in your music, right? Then you're going to act accordingly. Usually, whatever is disseminated becomes imitated. Power is the ability to define and shape reality and have other people accept your definition of reality as if it were their own. Is is not the way Nobles uh, correctly teaches us. So we're dealing with a deep seated self hatred that is allowed to manifest because we've been stripped of African history and culture. So this is why this trip that they made to Ghana for the Full Circle Festival, these African-American celebrities, this is why this is so important because it helps us to reconnect ourselves to ourselves, reconnect back to the source. So he talked about how we American born blacks uh, were bred to hate our own people and ourselves. Self-deprivation is buried deep within our subconscious. We found comfort in calling ourselves derogatory names and sabot sabotage our own progress because we've been convinced we are unworthy of the same things whites or other nations enjoy. When Jews visit the Holocaust Museum or Israel or Irish and Italian Americans travel to their homelands. There's zero backlash from their communities and communities outside. Ask yourselves, why is there always backlash from our own black community whenever we have pilgrimages, pilgrimages uh, to our homeland? Okay, when we go back to when we go back to Africa, why is there always backlash from the black community from African Americans, some African Americans, because they've been taught to hate who they are and love who they can't be. That's why. Now, if they go to Egypt, you may not get as much backlash because some African Americans think Egypt is part of the Middle East, and white people try to claim Egypt for themselves and say that the ancient Egyptians were brown skinned Caucasians or say they were white. So Egypt is held up on this pedestal. Okay? It's not sub Saharan Africa. Now, this is not only from the black, this is not only from other blacks, this negative backlash. It brings commentary from other communities who mysteriously seem entitled to chime in as well. So he goes on to say, quote, negative comments like, who do these N words think they are? They're celebrating slavery. Africans were complicit in slavery as well. This is just a publicity stunt. 
they just want attention. Why, why all, uh, they just want attention, end quote. So Michael Jai White goes on to ask the question, why all the hate? Why do folks care so much? It's like, it's like we threatened them, and we have. We have threatened them and other black folks to think better of us, therefore better of themselves. They're, you're challenging their cultural paradigm. You're challenging their perception of reality. Because then it, it forces them to ask the question, you know, why do most African Americans only speak English? Why do you, you know, I asked this, I, 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 I asked this question, I was doing a lecture and, uh, or a Facebook live broadcast, and I was talking about understanding how psychologically damaged so many African Americans are, right? So 154 years after chattel slavery ended, most African Americans still carry their slave master's name. Chattel slavery ended with the 13th Amendment, December 6, 1865, the 13th Amendment was ratified. December 18th, 1865, the 13th Amendment was adopted, okay? So we're talking about 154 years ago, chattel slavery ended after the Civil War ended, um, June 2nd, 1865. Most African Americans still carry their slave master's name. And you wonder why we're brain damaged? If we take it to another level, some people may not like this. What I say may go outside the circumference of some people's awareness, but if you understand history, you understand I'm telling the 100% truth. This is not an attack on anybody. This is understanding the programming. 154 years after chattel slavery ended, most African Americans are still practicing the religion that was forced on our forced on our ancestors by Europeans during slavery. 154 years after chattel slavery ended, most African Americans still practice the religion that was forced upon our ancestors by Europeans during slavery. This is not an attack on the Black Christian Church. This is not an attack on Black liberation theology. Well, I'm dealing with understanding history and understanding a mindset of African Americans who have largely been taught to hate themselves and the different methodology that was used to teach this and the methodology that's still being used to reinforce this mindset. So he said, why all the hate? Why do, why do folks care so much? It's like we threatened them and we have. We have threatened them and other black folks uh, to think better of us, therefore better of themselves. And, you know, when people are challenged to reassess their perception of reality, it can become threatening to them, especially if they think they have achieved some level of status or something like this, right, in society. and it's a level it's a it's a it's a level of status or something that's not beneficial to their people and this goes back to malcolm asking the question of who are you he said don't tell me negro what were you before the white man names you a negro so when people start asking themselves that question and they start realizing they don't know who they are it, it creates an emptiness inside So Michael Jai White goes on to say, we American Blacks are supposed, are supposed to think negatively about being connected to our homeland because that's how we were conditioned to think. We're supposed to think all Africa was, uh, was slavery when only an extremely small portion of the continent was ever involved in the slave trade. We're supposed to, uh, to see Africa as mainly, quote unquote, starving people and jungles. And, you know, if you go back to 19, uh, you go back to the 1930s, 40s, 50s, you go back to previous generations of African-Americans, one of the largest 
educators or miseducators of the continent of Africa for African Americans were the Tarzan movies, especially going back to 1940s and 50s, or the 30s, because you had uh, Buster Crab. Buster Crab, uh, you had Buster Crab and Johnny, uh, Johnny. Weismuller, I think was his last name. These were two of the actors who played Tarzan. And this was, um, when you look at when the Tarzan movies first started, I think they, I think they first started in the 1930s, okay? And we know that the Universal Negro Improvement Association, Marcus Garvey, we know that was big in the 1920s, okay? And um, I, I, I really think the Tarzan movies were some type of um, concerted effort to attack the pride that was instilled in many African Americans by the UNIA, the Universal Negro Improvement Association, which was teaching us to have pride in African heritage and African culture and to reconnect to Africa. Um, so I really, I, I really think the Tarzan movies were a concerted effort to try to attack that prideful mindset that Marcus Garvey instilled in us. When did Tarzan movies start? Okay, let me try to look up something right quick. Because I, I researched this before. I think the earliest Tarzan movies, okay, so they go back to 19... Uh, Tarzan of the Apes is a 1918 American uh, action adventure silent film. Yeah, it started out as a silent film. The UNIA starts in the U.S. in 19, basically 1916, because Garvey comes to the U.S. in 1916. The UNIA starts in um, Jamaica in 1914, okay? He comes to the U.S. He's in correspondence with Booker T. Washington. Um, and he read Booker T. Washington's book, Up From Slavery. So he was inspired by Booker T. Washington. Also, that was one of his inspirations, all right? And he comes to the U.S. in 1916, the year after Booker T. Washington passed away. And he starts setting up chapters of the UNIA. So I think the first UNIA chapter, um, I think that started in 19, about 1916, okay? But we see the first Tarzan movie starts in 1918. This is the period of time when the UNIA is building, okay? All right, so, but the Tarzan movies, Tarzan, the king of the jungle, this illiterate, uneducated white male, and first of all, the, the, uh, Africa is not jungle land. Most of it is grassy plain land. Africa is not, they really don't have jungles in Africa, but, here you have this white man who's the king of the jungle. Notice this. He's, he's uneducated, illiterate. And, 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 and um, it was Edgar Rice Burroughs who created the Tarzan character, okay? Tarzan character in these stories. And if you study the storyline, he was uh, orphaned um, by white people. He was orphaned, but he was raised by apes. OK. In the like original storyline, he was raised by apes. And he grows up, he grows up to be the king of the jungle. And uh, he can he can defeat the lion and be kill the lion and all this stuff. And here you have this white man ruling over the jungle in Africa. And then they would show the. Um, they would show the quote unquote Africans that depict them as savages, right? And show them trying to uh, 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 have the big have the big pot with the boiling hot water, showing them trying to trying to uh, uh, kill the missionaries and eat them. And they, they show they show all this stuff in the Tarzan movies, which were totally degrading to African Americans, dehumanizing. Okay, all right. So Erica said exactly Africa is vast, rich lands, which in appearance looks much like any other country. Yeah, 
And then you have, then you go into the cities and you have technologically advanced cities. You have 21st century cities in Africa also. Okay. All right. Let's continue here. Okay, so um, Michael J. White said, we American Blacks are supposed to think negatively about being connected to our homeland because that's how we were conditioned to think. Power is the ability to define and shape reality and have other people accept your definition of reality as if it, as if it were their own. Okay, power coming from the Latin word poter, meaning to be able. Okay, African-American business owners, hey, post the name of your business here on the podcast. Email us at customer service at AfricanHistoryNetwork.com. We'll let you know how you can advertise with the African History Network. And uh, we'll come to some more of your comments here in just a minute. Also, uh, you can donate to the African History Network if you like this type of information. PayPal.me, PayPal.me forward slash the AHN show uh, or AfricanHistoryNetwork.com. Click on the yellow donate button. And we have uh, our eight digital download bundle pack on sale, uh, eight of my lectures. Uh, regularly $80 on sale, uh, $30 uh, weekend sale. And this is uh, includes three of my lectures dealing with the film Black Panther and uh, five other presentations also. That's also at AfricanHistoryNetwork.com. And you can um, register for the online courses that I teach. They're all on demand. We have them in a 10 course online bundle pack, regularly $130 on sale, uh, $40. And that includes the 14 hour, seven session online course that I teach called Ancient Kemet, the Moors, and the Ma'afa, Understanding the Transatlantic Slave Trade, where they did teach you in school. We deal with thousands of years of history. We deal with the origins of the Transatlantic Slave Trade. What was it about? The 800-year occupation of Europe by the Africans known as the Moors, all of that. And I'm doing a PowerPoint presentation. We have video clips, things like that, in the um, online course. Okay, so you can watch from around the world. Watch it over and over again. All right, and also, that's also at AfricanHistoryNetwork.com. Okay, so um, he said that, uh, he went on to say, we're supposed to think all, uh, all Africa was, was slavery when only an extremely small portion of the continent was uh, even involved in the slave trade. So apparently he's talking about the transatlantic slave trade. Um, we're supposed to see Africa as mainly, quote unquote, starving people and jungles. So he goes on to say, we may call ourselves African-Americans, but we are truly disconnected from Africa. Most of us are truly disconnected from Africa, even though our DNA connects us right back to the motherland, connects us right back to Africa. I say we with a capital W-E because I'm not excluded. I thought my people came from South Carolina, which I now, which I now see is as stupid as a Chinese man saying his people came from Ohio. I track my heritage, uh, so I track my heritage uh, to uh, South Carolina was only, um, I track my heritage in South Carolina was only a small part of my people's journey that began in Ghana, okay? A place that had kings, well before Europe had their kings, okay? Because Ghana goes back to at least 300 BC, okay? If you read Classical Africa by Dr. Malefe Keti Asante, and Dr. Asante is the chair of the uh, Afro-American Studies Department at uh, Temple University. So I, I've interviewed Dr. Asante before, that's a friend of mine. Uh, Dr. Malefe Keti Asante, this is a bad brother, okay? and um, his book, Classical Africa. So this is a good book to use in schools. He wrote this uh, to be used in middle schools, okay? But I mean, adults can read this and learn a lot also. But when you study Ghana, Ghana goes back to uh, about 300 BC, okay? Uh, the origins of Ghana, okay? The, 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 um, and in here they talk about um, ancient Kemet, uh, Nubia, uh, Tanahesi, they talk about Abyssinia, Ethiopia, but they talk about Ghana, Songhai, and, and Mali also, all right? And uh, let me pull this up. So you can go to Maleficetti Asante's website, asante.net, and he has information on how to get his books. He writes articles as well. I think he's written something like 50, 60 books, all right? So page 94, which deals with the wealth of Ghana, okay? The wealth of Ghana. 
uh, the kingdoms of West Africa were listed among the greatest of their time by uh, Al Masudi, who was a uh, historian, okay, and uh, geographer. Um, the West African kingdoms of this period are Ghana, which goes back to 300 BC to two to 1200 Common Era or 1200 uh, AD, Mali, 1200 uh, Common Era. Uh, to 1500 Common Era, and Songhai, 1350 to 1600 uh, Common Era or AD, all right? So Ghana, the, the royalty in Ghana goes back before the royalty in England. Okay, let's continue here. So, um, he says, I, tr I tracked my heritage uh, to South Carolina, and, and uh, this was only a small part of uh, my people's journey that began in Ghana, a place that had kings well before Europe had theirs. For me to be instilled by the king uh, Ode uh, Ode Odeno, uh, Oden I'm not sure I pronounced that first name, uh, Kwafo Okoto III of Okwamu, um, is far more relevant than if I were knighted by Queen Elizabeth, whose royal bloodline does not go back as far. Ghana has been the eighth African country I've visited. Uh, they've all been astoundingly beautiful with classy and very educated people who speak more languages than we do. Those of, uh, those of us that felt some kind of way, uh, maybe you can begin to direct that anger toward those orchestrators that made you hate who you are, those who uh, those who would find comfort in you hating your own people, and those who would find it threatening for you to unite with your people in solidarity. I believe the original culprits are long dead, but their policies are alive and well. Please ask yourself if Mark Wahlberg or Ben Affleck went back to their place of heritage, would you care? If Mark, Wal Mark Wahlberg or Ben Affleck went back to their place of heritage, would you care? They have a country that loves and embraces them. We have a whole continent that loves and embraces us. In Africa, a voice uh, command, they say in Africa, a voice commands him to look around uh, and the voice asks, do you see any N words here? He answers meekly, no. Uh, and uh, do you know why? Because there aren't any. That's Richard Pryor. That's Richard Pryor who talked about in his stand-up special, his stand-up comedy uh, special uh, uh, um, on Sunset Strip. He talked about going to Africa and how it changed him. And he, he said he wasn't going to use the N word anymore. OK, when he realized that that was a word used by Europeans to dehumanize us. OK, and he went to Africa and he had a he had a he had a um, a change in his mindset. He talked about the impact that Africa had on him. This is Richard Pryor. All right. Uh, what tribe is he chief of? Um, I'm, I'm not sure if I saw which tribe. Uh, Akwamu is in um, Ghana. I'm not sure if I saw which tribe. I have to maybe go back and look, and we'll post the name of the article here so you can go back and uh, check this out also, okay? Um, let me see something here. Yeah, I'm not, uh, I'm not sure. But we'll post it. We'll post the article here. Um, so you can check this out. Uh, let's see. Moni, okay, Sammy, uh, Chip, Rosario said, this is the truth. Thanks, Captain Prescott Smith. Athena said, uh, Erica posted Asante.net. Yeah, check out Maleficati Asante's website because he has a really good article that I use in uh, the online course that I teach. Uh, ancient Kemet, the Moors, and the Ma'afa, understanding the transatlantic slave trade, what they didn't teach you in school. He has a uh, article dealing with 
um, the transatlantic slave trade. And, it, and, and really what it is, it's an article that was a rebuttal to Dr. Henry Louis Gates Jr. Okay, because see Gates, even though Gates writes some good articles, because I've read dozens of articles that Gates writes, one, Dr. Henry Louis Gates Jr. is not African-centered, number one. Number two, he is an apologist for Europeans, and he is not really an advocate for reparations to be paid to uh, uh, African-Americans, okay, descendants of slaves. He's not an advocate for that. So he wrote, he wrote an op-ed article back in 2010 called Ending the Slavery Blame Game, Ending the Slavery Blame Game. And his whole thing is trying to absolve Europeans of responsibility for paying, uh, paying any type of reparations. And um, what, so what he does is he tries to take, um, he tries to take exceptions to the rule when it comes to the African involvement in slavery. And he tries to extrapolate that and make that the rule. To, because he, because his argument is that Africans were equally culpable in the transatlantic slave trade as Europeans, and that's not true. And in this article from Alefe Ketia Asante, he totally destroys um, he totally destroys uh, Henry Louis Gates' argument. Okay, because see, uh, Malefe Ketia Asante, his studies are in, uh, like his PhD, I think is in Afro-American studies, something like that, okay? Gates' background is in African-American literature. That's what his PhD and his master's degree are in, is like in African-American literature, okay? Uh, the Slave Trade and Reparations, Closing the Gates, okay? That's the name of this article from January 22nd, 2011. This, this, was, a, this was a rebuttal to uh, the op-ed article that Henry Louis Gates Jr. wrote in the New York Times. Because see, people like Gates, they're given access, right, to the New York Times and things like this to put forth this nonsense that benefits white supremacy, okay? Henry Louis Gates Jr., so this is what Maleficetti Asante said. Henry Louis Gates Jr.'s, Jr.'s recent essay on slavery and reparations in the New York Times April 23rd, 2010, caused me to reflect on my previous critiques of several of Gates' projects. Uh, let me see, uh, let me see. Yeah, okay, this, yeah, this is the actual article, okay. I thought it was one he wrote before this, but maybe not, okay. The, um, caused me to reflect on my previous critiques of several of Gates' projects, such as Encarta Africana, documentaries, and, and uh, wonders of the African world. Gates is a combative, assertive, and quite active intellectual. He is not a do-nothing or say-nothing person, which would sometimes be a good thing given the wide distribution of his opinions. Since that is not the case, it is necessary to logically dismantle the superstructure Henry Gates has created to defend the Europeans' gross violation of African humanity. I will seek to disentangle the, this issue with two steps. In the first instance, I will attack the factual errors in Gates' article showing that the core of his argument that Africans and Europeans might both be culpable for the slave trade is false. Secondly, I will establish the argument and warrants for reparations, enlarging the argument to include far more than the narrow focus, uh, foc uh, narrow focus envisioned by Gates. Attacking the factual error of Gates' essay is essential for the plinths upon which the reparations argument stands, okay? So you can read this because this is a long article, but, but Asante goes through and just totally destroy Gates' uh, his argument. And one of the things Asante talks about is who owned the ship-making companies that made the ships? 
who controlled the slave trading companies because wealthy Europeans organized themselves into slave trading companies, okay? The Dutch East India Company, the Dutch West Indian Company, the Brandenburg Company, the Royal African Company. These were slave trading companies that were financed by wealthy Europeans to finance these voyages to pick up, to pick up Africans and enslave them. OK, so he talks about who, who owned the ship making companies, who owned the insurance companies that took out insurance policies on the slave ships and on the Africans on the ships, who owned the slave trading companies. OK, who owned the plantations, who who left their homes and went to Africa to pick up Africans to enslave them. OK, so he goes through and just he goes through and systematically dismantles Gates' whole, ar whole, whole argument, all right? So check out this article here, uh, The Slave Trading and Reparations. This is one of them. I think there was uh, another one that Asante had as well that I bookmarked. Let me see. Oh, yeah, this is the main one. That I, knew, I knew it was another one. This is the main one right here. Henry Louis Gates is wrong about African involvement in the slave trade. Yeah, this was the one I was talking about. This was the this was the main rebuttal. This was from May 6, 2010. I knew I knew it was in 2010 that he did the rebuttal. This one right here, he goes through and totally dismantles Gates' argument. Okay. He said over the past 20 now, just to give you some background on um uh, uh Asante, Dr. Malefic Keti Asante. He's among the most published contemporary scholars, having written over 70 books and over 400 articles, okay? And as I said, he's a, he's a professor and chair of the Department of African American Studies at Temple University, okay? He's considered by his peers to be one of the most distinguished contemporary scholars. And um, let me see here. All right, but this is the main article right here. Henry Louis Gates is wrong about African involvement in the slave trade, okay? And he says, over the past 25 years, I have made, I have had various exchanges, some quite useful and productive with Henry Louis Gates. We have shared a couple of public meetings and dinners during conferences, book signings, and the like. However, we have rarely agreed on black studies, black history, Afrocentricity, black nationalism, or the slave trade. The recent essay on slavery and reparations in the New York Times from April 23, 2010, caused me to reflect on my previous critiques of several of Gates' projects, such as Encarta Africana, Documentaries and Wonders of the African uh, World. Uh, okay, so then he gets, so he has like the first two paragraphs in this article and the other one, okay? So Asante says, first we must get the terms of the argument straight. There is no African slave trade, no transatlantic slave trade. There's only European slave trade across the ocean as there is the Arab slave trade across the desert because the Arabs were enslaving Africans hundreds of years before the transatlantic slave trade or, or the Europeans started enslaving them. The Arabs were enslaving them going back to uh, 8th century AD, okay? He said, I say European slave trade because the motive for kidnapping and transporting Africans across the ocean was a European initiative. Dr. Henry Louis Gates Jr. attempts to show Africans as being equally culpable with Europeans in the enslaving of Africans in order to argue in his narrative superstructure that it is difficult to say who should pay reparations. This is, this is Gates' whole game because he's financed by Europeans. This is his whole game to absolve Europeans of responsibility for, for reparations, okay? So check out this article here from uh, Dr. Malefe Kete Asante, okay? Henry Louis Gates is wrong about African involvement in the slave trade. And he goes through and just totally dismantles his argument, okay? 
And you can read his articles at asante.net, A-S-A-N-T-E, asante.net. All right, we just posted it here. Okay, how's everybody doing? All right, let's come to some more of your comments. How do you all like this type of information? Okay, yes, yeah, Steve, we just posted the links there. How do you all like this type of information? Eugene said truth. Uh, Maria said reparations is due to African people who suffered the ma'afa. The ma'afa is a key Swahili word, which means the great disaster. That's our, holo that's our holocaust. It is due from all of the European countries as well as America. It is also due to continental Africans, including Australia's indigenous people. Okay, Gates is married to a white lady. Yeah, Dr. Henry Louis Gates, he's married to a white woman, yeah. Um, Ralph said, why when I go apply for a job, I never see none of a white country, never say for American, French, or UK American, but African American, I think in front of black people in the Caribbean. Okay, I'm not, let's see. Putting Africa in front of each country, for example, African Haitian. All right. Okay, Steve, okay. How long has he been there? How long has who been where, uh, Steve? What are you talking about? All right. Okay, and um, if you like this type of information, be sure to register for the online courses I teach. They're all on demand. We go deep into this type of information. Uh, it includes, it's a 10 course online bundle pack, which includes ancient Kemet, the Moors, and the Ma'afa, understanding the transatlantic slave trade what they didn't teach you in school, okay? And that's a 14 hour, seven session online course that I teach, which deals with thousands of years of history. And I do a PowerPoint presentation. We have video clips, uh, book references, everything, all right? I'm gonna, uh, I'm gonna show you very uh, quickly here uh, some of the information that we cover in the online, um, the online course is regularly $130. A 10 course bundle pack is on sale uh, right now, uh, $40. We just have a, we have a weekend sale going on. So it's on sale $40. Let me uh, pull this up. I'll, I'll just show you quickly here some of the things that we um, cover in the online course. Let's see. Let's flip this over. All right. Um, and you can post your comments here if you have any more comments. So we do a PowerPoint presentation like this here. Uh, let me skip forward. And uh, and then also the online bundle packet includes an online class I did dealing with the film Black Panther. Because Black Panther is deep. I'll be talking about Black Panther during African American History Month in some of my presentations. I've done a number of lectures dealing with the film Black Panther. Black Panther reconnects you to African history, African culture, African languages, spiritual systems. It's a very, very deep movie on multiple levels. Okay, so here's some of the things we deal with. We deal with what was a transatlantic slave trade? What were some of the events that led up to the transatlantic slave trade starting? What role did Christopher Columbus play? Because Columbus is, is uh, uh, you, you have to understand Christopher Columbus to understand the transatlantic slave trade. We deal with Columbus um, because Columbus and his four voyages, um, when he set sail um, August 3rd, 1492 on the uh, Nina the Penta and the Santa Maria, okay, um, Columbus and his four voyages helps to lay the foundation for slavery, racism, capitalism, and the exploitation of indigenous people, all right? Um, and when you um, and one of the things that's important to understand about Christopher Columbus is that he never came to the land that we call the United States of America. So this is something I show you in the online course. I show you where Columbus went on his four voyages. Now we know he had African Moors navigating some of his ships, okay, like Pedro Alonso Nino, right? But August third, fourteen ninety two. Um, he set sail, and we know all, October 12, 1492, that's when he lands in the Bahamas. That's where he first landed. Um, and he called it San Salvador, okay, which means Saint Savior. Okay, he said he named it after his Savior, Jesus the Christ, but then it became a devil to the people. He also goes into Cuba and Hispaniola, which we call Haiti, okay, 
because uh, he goes into, uh, you know, Hispaniola. And, and so Haiti and the Dominican Republic, they're on the same island. So this is, he uncovers this also. He didn't discover it. He uncovered it. There were already people there. And, it's some, and 70 percent of the people Columbus encountered on his four voyages were African people also. This is something Dr. David M. Hotel uh, deals with in his book, The First Americans Were Africans, Documented Evidence. 70% of the people Columbus encountered on his four voyages were African people because we were already in those lands as well. So on his second voyage, September 1493, he goes into the West Indies and he goes into Boric Boriquin, or what we call Puerto Rico. And in the 1494, he goes into Jamaica. So the Spanish are setting up slave plantations in these new areas, and they're setting up these sugarcane plantations also, all right? And the sugarcane sugar cane plantations were very br brutal. You need a very uh, warm, you know, hot climate, tropical climate, to grow the sugarcane. That's more conducive for growing sugar sugarcane. His third voyage, May of 1498, he goes into Trinidad and the Venezuelan mainland, and he goes into South America. His fourth and last voyage, May of 1504, he goes into Panama and Honduras and Central America. So he never comes to the land that we call the United States of America. The closest he came here was Cuba, which is 90 miles away. And when you read the first Americans with Africans documented evidence, Dr. David M. Hotep talks about how 70% of the people Columbus encountered in uh, the islands were African people. Okay. All right. So, um, so also some of the things that we deal with, uh, let's see. Okay, what role did Christopher Columbus play? When did Africans first come to the US as slaves? Because even though we were here in this land going back tens of thousands of years, um, the Spanish were taking Africans into the territory we call South Carolina in the 1520s. This is 100 years before Jamestown, Virginia, because keep in mind, the Spanish were involved in the slave trade right, right behind the Portuguese. And when the Spanish are kicking the Moors out of Spain, some of the Moors are fleeing. Others, other, some, some of the Moors are being conquered and being enslaved, and they're taken into Spanish territories as slaves. And, and they're taken into Florida, and they're taken into South Carolina. That, that was Spanish territory, Florida and South Carolina. The, the territories we call today Florida and South Carolina, that was Spanish territory. Okay. Um, Juan Ponce de Leon, the Spanish conquistador, comes into Florida in 1513. He has Juan Garrido with him, who was of West African descent and um, who was, you know, an African man, Juan Garrido. This is 1513 in Florida. Now, did Africans sell themselves into slavery? We deal with that complicated history because it's not like what we've been taught. Were African people in America before the slave trade? Yes, we were. This was our land stolen from us. This is what we have to understand. The 800-year occupation of Europe by the Africans known as the Moors was just because the Moors saved Europe. They introduced the alchemy of what we call chemistry. They introduced all types of new foods. They introduced medicine. Uh, the periodic tables, all this in Europe. And this brings Europe out of the dark ages. This saves Europe. Shocking archaeological discoveries that are causing experts to rethink everything. So we deal with some of the recent archaeological discoveries in the past couple of years that are causing them to have to push the dates back and understanding that migrations took place out of Africa tens of thousands of years before they first thought in June or July of 2017, there was a discovery in Morocco where they discovered, uh, in Morocco, they discovered uh, uh, skeletons of uh, like uh, remains of Homo sapiens sapiens that date back um, 300,000 to 350,000 years ago, which is 100,000 years older than the oldest remains of Homo sapiens that were found in Ethiopia that date back 195,000 years ago. And when all these discoveries come out, the archaeologists, the scientists, the paleontologists, they say, this is causing us to have to rethink everything. This is, it, it, when these discoveries happen, it totally blows their mind. 
So the deeper they dig, the blacker the planet gets, the more research they do, the older we get. They keep having to push the dates back. Just like Juvenile had the song back in like 98 called Back That Thing Up. When, when, the, when the evidence comes out, they keep having to back the dates up. They keep having to back that thing up. So we deal with um, insurance companies that took out insurance policies on slave ships and enslaved Africans on the plantations also. Okay, because there were at least 262 skills, trades, and crafts that African people had in this country from 1619 to 1865. And these skills, trades, and crafts were used to build this country. And oftentimes we would do some of the very dangerous work, working in coal mines, working in steel, uh, steel mills, or working, in, uh, working on steam engines, things like this. And... Uh, so a lot of times we would die on the job because we're doing very dangerous work. So you had insurance companies that sold insurance policies on the slaves on the plantation so that when a slave died untimely, uh, the slave master could cash in the insurance policy, right, and go buy another slave. So we do a Freemasonry America and the Founding Fathers because Freemasonry is based upon the teachings that the Moors took in Europe that come from ancient Kim and ancient Egypt. In uh, Stolen Legacy, George G.M. James talks about how the Moors were the custodians of the ancient Egyptian mystery systems. We deal with the origins of the term America and Africa and more, the problem with slave movies and why we're being bombarded with slave movies and the slave themed TV show. We deal with the the mythology, the first holy trinity of Osar, Oset, and Heru, who the Greeks called Osiris, Isis, and Horus, Heru being born of a virgin birth on December 25th. Uh, we deal with the concepts of the Immaculate Conception, because all these are very ancient stories, very ancient principles, over and over and over again. And the earliest, the, the, I mean, the, the story of the Immaculate Conception and all this stuff, that goes back to at least 3300 BC in uh, ancient Nubia. OK, so we deal with some of that history, history links to ancient Kemet, uh, ancient Egypt and early Christianity. The fake Willie Lynch letter of 1712, because Willie Lynch never historically existed. OK, we need to take the Willie Lynch letter and throw it in the garbage can. That's one of the biggest frauds. Willie Lynch never historically existed. OK, um, so these are just some of the things we deal with in the uh, online courses. And they're all on demand. Watch at your own pace. Watch over and over again. Um, watch from all around the world. So this is Dr. David M. Hotep's uh, book, The First Americans Were Africans, Documented Evidence. His new book, The First Americans Were Africans Revisited, comes out at the end of February 2019. So I talked to him a few weeks ago. And he said it's coming out uh, end of February 2019. And uh, it has like 200 extra pages because this book is out of print. Unless you can get it from a book dealer, it's not going to charge you three or $400 for it because that's how much they charge it most places on uh, uh, on uh, Amazon, okay? But check out his website, historictruth.info, historictruth.info, because you can download a um, abstract of his, a two-page abstract of his book which gives you some information. So on page 14 of the first Americans were Africans documented evidence, he talks about how um, a discovery that was made in 2004 by Dr. Albert Goodyear, who is an archeologist at the University of South Carolina, okay? And they found evidence of an African presence dating back at least 51,700 years ago at a campsite in Allendale County, South Carolina. And they discovered artifacts, architecture, campsites, carvings, Egyptian writings, footprints and lava, genetic M174D haploid groups dealing with DNA and genetics, linguistics, paintings, skulls, skeleton structures, and tools. They found 13 different disciplines fairly documenting an African presence in this country that we call the United States of America going back at least 51,700 years ago. Now, if you saw the interview I did with uh, Dr. Claude Anderson, um, 
off of black labor, white wealth, and power economics, things like this. I interviewed him January 13th on the African History Network show, and he talked about the Folsom people who come from West Africa. And they were here going back thousands of years ago also, going back about 13,000 to 15,000 years ago, the Folsom people. And Folsom, Arizona is named after them. Folsom Prison is named after them as well. They come after the Khoisan, but they, but they were here. This is thousands of years before the transatlantic slave trade started, before African slaves were being brought to this land, okay? So this was our land stolen from us. I'm not saying the transatlantic slave trade did not happen. I'm saying we need to understand the chronology of history leading up to the transatlantic slave trade happening and understanding that African people were in, were in this land long before the transatlantic slave trade started. So we have, to, we have to understand that history, okay? All right, and then um, let's share this again here. So this is Dr. Albert Goodyear. Now this is an article from sciencedaily.com, which is a scientific website. ScienceDaily.com. New evidence puts man in North America 50,000 years ago. New evidence puts man in North America 50,000 years ago. Now, this article is from uh, 15 years ago, November 18, 2004. And here's a synopsis of the article. Here's a summary of what ScienceDaily.com says the article is about. Radiocarbon tests of carbonized plant remains where artifacts were unearthed last May along the Savannah River in Allendale, in Allendale County by University of South Carolina archaeologist Dr. Albert Goodyear indicate that the sediments containing these artifacts are at least 50,000 years old, meaning that humans inhabited North America long before the last ice age. Who were these humans 50,000 years ago? See, this is information that a lot of our people don't know. That's why we, we can't just study the last 500 years of history. We need to study at least the last 50,000 years of history. All right, so we do a number of different archeological discoveries. Uh, this was the lost city of Egypt called Tanis Heraklion. Heraklion that was actually uncovered in the year 2000 and they were excavating all, all of this all, all these things and artifacts they were finding uh, at the bottom of the sea, okay? And I talked about this in the, uh, back in 2013, when the artifacts that were uh, discovered were being revealed. This, this, is, this is an article from uh, Yahoo News, news.yahoo.com. Sunken Egyptian city reveals 1,200 year secrets. And they talk about how they found 64 ships at the bottom of the sea, 16 foot tall statues, 700 anchors, countless gold coins and small artifacts. And uh, it's believed Thomas Heraklion was swallowed into the sea about 1200 years ago. This, this was this known as the lost city of Egypt. And it was built around eighth century BC. Okay. So these are some of the things we do with the, do within the online course. Um, once again, it's all on demand. Watch at your own pace. Um, let me see here. So we deal with thousands of years of history. We deal with uh, the Africans known as the Moors also. I'll pull that up here. Because the Moors tie right into ancient Kim and ancient Egypt. And to understand the transatlantic slave trade, you have to understand January 2nd, 1492, when the Moors lose uh, control of the last stronghold in Spain, Grenada. And when we look at something like this, we have the Washington Monument, which is 555 feet tall, which is an African symbol known as a Tekken. The Greeks called it an obelisk, and it comes from the mythology of Asar Aset and Heru, okay? who the Greeks called Osiris, Isis, and Horus, and there were about 1,200 Tekkenu all throughout ancient Egypt. Okay, today there are only about 12 of them. 
So this is an ancient African symbol, which is a symbol of transformation and resurrection. And when we look at Freemasonry, we see the teachings coming from ancient Kemet, and ancient Egypt are the foundations of Freemasonry. And the word Mason is derived from the Latin words mass and son. And Mason means child of light and expresses the desire to pursue light, which is a metaphor for the sun, S-U-N, which symbolizes knowledge. Okay, Mason means child of light. The term child of light or sons and daughter of light was first used to identify students who had completed 42 years of study in the temples of ancient Kemet or ancient Egypt. Many Masonic temples were modeled after the temples of Kemet, places where light or knowledge was imparted in a series of steps or degrees. So read Egypt on the Potomac by Tony Browder. Okay, pages 18 and 32. So when you go to an institution of higher learning and you get your credentials in a series of degrees, this is where that comes from. That comes from the temples in ancient Kemet. So you get a bachelor's degree, associate's degree, master's degree, bachelor's degree, PhD, okay, doctoral degree. This is where that comes from. All right, so once again, uh, Willie Lynch may be a, ho a hoax. Willie Lynch may be a, a hoax, but do you believe those practices by the slave owner told? Most of that stuff didn't even happen like that. If you read the uh, articles from uh, Professor Manu Ampim, Ampim, A M P I M, who I've interviewed a number of times, um, he has, go to his website, manuampim.com. And he has uh, three articles, Death to the Willie Lynch Speech, Death to the Willie Lynch Speech. And he talks about how even the methodology that's talked about in the Willie Lynch letter, that's not how it really happened during slavery. And he goes and he separates the fact from fiction. So the best thing to do is take the Willie Lynch letter and throw it in the garbage can. It's an absolute fraud. Uh, it was written about 1970 by Dr. Kwabina Ashanti. Dr. Kwabina Ashanti has come out and admitted he wrote the Willie Lynch letter. It didn't, it, if you understand language and syntax and sentence structures, that language that's used in the Willie Lynch letter is 20th century language. That's not language from the early 18th, 18th century, okay, in, in, in Britain. They didn't, even, they, didn't, they, didn't even, they didn't even speak that way in 1712. Their, their words in the Willie Lynch letter like self-refueling, which comes from the transportation industry of the 20th century. Their words in the Willie Lynch letter that didn't even exist in the early 18th century, or if they did exist, the way that they're used in the 20th, 20th century is different than the way they were used in the early 18th century. So there are, tr there are a tremendous number of clues in the Willie Lynch letter of 1712 to let you know it's an absolute fraud. Best thing to do is throw it in the garbage can and study real history. All right, so uh, let me post a link here again. Um, you can register for the online courses I teach. We have them in the bundle pack. It's on sale forty dollars, regularly one hundred thirty dollars. Because after this weekend, it's going back. Uh, we have a sale going on this weekend, so it's forty dollars. And it's all on demand. Watch at your own pace. Watch all around the world. Okay. And also at our website, AfricanHistoryNetwork.com, we have my DVD lectures, we have bundle packs there. We have the uh, bundle pack, the Africans that were here before Columbus, the Africans that were here before Columbus, uh, which is on sale this dollars regularly, I think it's regularly like 80, 80 or $100, something like that. So it includes a uh, uh, the double lecture I did with Dr. David M. Hotel, who wrote the book, The First Americans Were Africans, Documented Evidence. Uh, includes a double lecture I did with uh, uh, Professor Kaba Kamene from the Hidden Colors documentaries that deals with uh, Africa, Mexico, and the Mississippi Valley. Uh, you get a, a lecture from uh, Dr. Ivan Van Sertima, who wrote They Came Before Columbus. Also, uh, uh, one from Dr. John Henry Clark dealing with Christopher Columbus and the African Holocaust. So it's an eight DVD bundle pack the Africans that were here before Columbus, the Africans that were here before Columbus, okay? 
All right, so we'll post those links here. It's also at our website, AfricanHistoryNetwork.com. Hey, remember at the African History Network, we focus on educating, empowering, and inspiring people of African descent throughout the diaspora and around the world, because right now it's correct for own behavior. If you want me, uh, you know, um, for the month of February at Nandy's Knowledge Cafe in Highland Park, Michigan, which is inside of Detroit, uh, I'll be doing lectures uh, every Saturday, February 2nd. It, it starts February 2nd, 2 p.m. to 6 p.m. But each Saturday in February at Nandy's Knowledge Cafe, 71 Oakman Avenue, I'll be doing lectures uh, for African American History Month. Uh, it starts off February 2nd, 2019, and we'll deal with. Uh, the history of Black Wall Street in Tulsa, Oklahoma, okay? So we'll talk some more about that on uh, my show, the African History Network show. We'll have the flyers this week. We'll have the information at africanhistorynetwork.com also. But Nandy's Knowledge Cafe, located at 71 Oakman Avenue in Highland Park, Michigan, um, each Saturday in uh, February, I'll be doing lectures, dealing with our history. 2 p.m. to 6 p.m. is free, free event, donations accepted. I have my DVD lectures there also. And uh, if you want me to do a presentation for your group or organization, you can email me at customer service at AfricanHistoryNetwork.com, customer service at AfricanHistoryNetwork.com, okay? And African-American business owners, email us. so We can let you know how to advertise with the African History Network also. All right, look out to get out of here. Hey, remember the African History Network, we focus on educating and empowering and inspiring people of African descent throughout the diaspora and around the world because right now it's correct wrong behavior. It's not over till we win Wakanda forever. We'll talk to you next time. Peace.